I stood in the doorway, looking at the screaming redhead. The pouring rain stuck her hair to her face in long strands. Despite this icy, pouring rain, she continued her furious tirade. To be completely honest, I couldn't make out all of her words through the roar of the rain and the emptiness that sounded in my own ears. However, I understood the essence of what was happening. My wife, Beth, was having an affair with the redhead's husband, Justin. The furious redhead, Nicole, Nikki to friends, wanted me to stop it. I knew this. A couple of months ago, my wife of nine years called me while I was on a rare business trip, and as I watched the cold rain patter on the window of a gloomy hotel, she said she wanted a divorce. Because we were growing apart from each other. I was only gone for a couple of weeks, and we only lived there for five months after I left the army. I didn't even know we had problems. She never said anything about it. As far as I could tell, she had been emotionally involved with this jerk for three months and was probably able to arrange everything physically while I was away on business. I wasn't able to piece it all together until a week before the redhead showed up on my doorstep, and I still had no proof. And I was still trying to come up with a plan. My wife agreed to counseling as a courtesy long before I knew about the affair, but she actually stopped going to sessions together after the second one. I suspected that she was trying to convince the counselor to guide me toward accepting the breakup. I think the main reason for the supposed counseling period was so she could tell her family and friends how hard she was trying, especially her parents. Her appearance in their eyes was really, really important, perhaps the most important thing in her world. So she served her time, continuing to date the jerk and living off my salary until she was sure everything would look good and he would be ready to leave his wife and child while she was buying waves of damn shoes to fill her closet. Beth and I had two-year-old twins, Angie and Amy. She happily left me to sit with them as soon as I got home so she could go to the gym or run, both activities she did often enough to stay in the best shape of her life. But after the gym, she and the jerk would sneak out to have sex somewhere. Unhappy is hardly a word to describe my feelings, Whenever I tried to solve problems or talk to her about anything, she would turn into a screaming rage, denying any guilt and blaming me for every ill on earth. She also spent a lot of time telling me how hard it was for her to watch the kids at home while I was at work, that she was trying to make things work, and that I was just trying to use the kids against her, none of which were true or even true. Meaning, with her gone every evening and most weekends, I watched the kids more hours a week than she did while working a full-time job. The conversation with the lawyer about the divorce was depressing. Treason was actually unimportant in our state. It was possible to file for divorce for this reason, but it had no real effect. And Beth was obviously well aware that the court almost always awarded custody and substantial child support to the wife, regardless of her behavior. Child support for several years was also the norm if there were small children. This way, the ex-wife could stay at home and be a good mother, instead of rushing to work. So there stood the screaming redhead, a rather ugly specimen, tall and a little awkward, with something like a beak instead of a nose and thin, angry lips, still soft in the middle after the birth of a six-month-old child, with several extra pounds that, frankly, did not sit on her very good. Anger and cold rain made her pale skin mottled. I couldn't get a word in edgewise, so I stood back, holding the door open, and waved her in. I already realized that the neighbors shouldn't hear a woman screaming at me without a door filter. I've already had a lot of practice lately. She followed me, continuing to loudly degrade my manhood as I walked to the dining room and pulled out a chair for her, then sat down myself. And I waited. As she calmed down, her rage turned to bitter tears, then to shaking sobs, and finally to sniffles as her head fell into her hands on the table, her hair forming a heap of wet, limp, dark copper mass. I waited a little longer until the snoring stopped. Are you finished? Quiet. She raised her head, eyes red from crying, and sobbed twice, but didn't say anything, so I continued. If I could do something, I would. I don't like it any more than you do. I continued to explain how the law worked and how I was at a disadvantage. You need to kick that cheap bitch out. It won't be long before she lets go of her anger. Not that I blame her. 
Great plan. Then I could end up in jail and then on the streets instead of at home. We sat in silence for a while until I got up and prepared some hot tea. I did my best not to stare. She may not have been a beauty, but she really had beautiful breasts, and I hadn't come across anything like that for a long time. She shivered as the hot tea warmed her. Damn, I didn't realize I was so cold. I didn't say anything, but she suddenly looked at her chest. Damn, again. Not particularly creative with words, she clasped her hands on herself. I sighed to myself. It was the closest I'd had to sex in four months. I can get you a sweater or something. As long as it wasn't that bitch's thing. I walked over and found one of my hoodies, which she quickly put on and buttoned up. She began to squirm, pulled her arms out of her sleeves, and then, after a few twirls, she dropped her wet shirt and bra from underneath and pulled her arms back through her sleeves. I picked them up and threw them in the dryer. I took the towel and handed it to her. For your hair. Thank you. She dried her hair and I watched as her breasts bounced under her sweatshirt. It was strange to feel drawn to something at that moment. Damn, I almost forgot what it was like to be aroused, so I let myself stare. Eventually, her hair dried out and she stopped. I hate them, she hissed. Me too. I never saw this coming. This caused her to feel pain comparable to my own. I can't compete with her. She's in perfect shape and beautiful. I'm fat after having a baby. She wasn't really overweight, maybe an extra kilo or so. She was out of shape, but so was I. But in a way she was right. Beth was beautiful in a way you rarely see in real life. Blonde with blue eyes, slender and graceful, as only a person can be. Still, Nikki needed something to hold on to. She's in good shape because she has time to go to the gym and run. And you're not fat. A small glow of something other than suffering flashed. So, what's next? I shrugged. I have no idea. No matter how I spin it, I'm left alone, with no money, and she controls access to the kids. I told her what I had pieced together. What if you have proof? It doesn't matter in court. They don't care. The same things that hurt me should work for you in court. No way Justin works for his cousin at a construction company. Most of his salary is unofficial, so there is almost no official money for alimony or maintenance. I assumed she meant alimony. She continued, I, I just want to crush them. I thought for a minute. What can we really do to hurt them? She shrugged. I continued, feeling a little better. I might finally have an ally in this mess of assholes. Seriously, everyone has done something. We just have to find it. The paycheck under the table from his cousin might be a good starting point. I thought about it. Some of the shoes that just showed up in Beth's closet looked really expensive. This money had to come from somewhere. Something is happening. Beth is spending money from somewhere. She nodded with a slight glimmer of real energy. We could check it out. I chuckled. It'll be easy. We'll gather the kids and sneak around like a bad Magnum P.I. Brady Bunch crossover. No, my sister Angie can look after the kids. She's looking after Jamie at home right now. She pondered, looking a little wistful. So, where are your children? They're sleeping upstairs. She looked around the room, her gaze stopping at the closed front door. Do you have sweatpants? I'm still wet. I moved to the folded underwear and pulled out my sweatpants as she stepped out of her shoes. I handed them to her and started pointing her towards the bathroom, but she turned her back to me and unbuttoned her wet jeans, pulled her jeans and panties down and stepped out of them. Then she began to quite slowly dry her legs and ass with a towel. The invitation was pretty obvious, and I could almost hear her nerves crackling. I felt the risk she was taking. She already felt rejected. If a guy with a grudge who had every reason to seek revenge and who also had been deprived of sex for as long as I had, turned her down, she would be heartbroken. I felt a surge of anger, but the anger was directed at my wife for putting me in this position. Nikki continued to say, I can't believe Justin could do this to me. I took a step forward and placed one hand on her bare side. She started shaking and her voice caught in her throat, but she didn't move away so I put my other hand on her other side. Her voice became softer. I don't like you, but I hate him. 
She pushed herself back towards me. I caressed her side with one hand and unbuttoned her sweatshirt with the other, lowering it to the floor at our feet. I moved one hand down to cup her ass. Her breasts weren't as firm and her ass was softer and wider than Beth's as I could remember after such a long time, but Nikki appreciated my touch. Her skin was still icy from the cold rain, and she seemed to press herself into the warmth of my arms. And when I gently kissed her neck, letting my teeth touch her skin, her legs almost gave way. I let my bottom hand slide around and between her legs. She moaned softly. We had very rough sex. We slowly pulled apart, and I grabbed a couple of towels, handing her one. After we dried off, I threw her jeans and panties into the dryer, along with her shirt and bra, and we sat, naked, at the table for a few more minutes, sipping our now cold tea. She looked at me darkly from under her wild curls of red hair. You knew this would happen when you invited me in. Actually, not until you took off your jeans. She giggled like a little girl. It was a little unsettling. I was terrified that you would refuse. I smiled, which I felt for the first time in a long time. What guy could say no to that? Justin, no problem. I think seeing the baby being born did it. He was in the room, he got scared, threw up, and he hasn't shown any interest in me or the baby since. I shook my head. I've heard of something like this before, but before I could say anything, she continued. So how could Beth, any woman, turn down the kind of sex you gave me? You're so much better than Justin. I have no idea. She just lost interest in me. Justin is younger and she felt old because of the kids, I think. It hasn't been like this. I waved toward the towels. Since the twins were born, I think. She felt like she should be more motherly to me or something. I'll be sore, but I'll keep it in my mind, especially when Jerk tells me to sleep in Jamie's room tonight because he's tired from training. I can't believe you can't control your bitch. I still don't like you. Bastard. Bitch! There was anger in those words, but we both knew it wasn't really directed at each other. The dryer buzzer went off. I smiled. If you really want to do something about this, see if your sister can babysit my kids with yours tomorrow night. And we better wrap this up. They'll be back in about an hour, and I need some sweep here. I'll be here. Better use an air freshener because this smells like hot, sweaty sex. She put on her clothes and practically danced her way out of the house. I cleaned the room thoroughly and put the towels and sweatshirts in the washing machine along with my clothes. When Beth returned home, it was surprisingly easy for me to avoid the nightly talk, the argument we always had where she denied everything and lied about everything. She seemed a little confused by my lack of mood. It's amazing how great angry sex can relieve tension. She also seemed to notice the spotlessly clean kitchen, I think she was commenting on the amount of air freshener, but honestly, I didn't care. I was still riding the wave of post-sex hormones. She was also embarrassed when I missed the almost ritualized failed attempt to kiss her goodbye when I left for work the next morning. I didn't even try, and I could see how it caught her off guard when I just took it and walked out. One way or another, I was going to stop sitting around feeling miserable and get this over with. Somehow. At work... I agreed to borrow a friend's car for the next few months. With Nikki's sister, who surprisingly resembled her, looking after the kids at home, we set off. Our plan was to scout out the office trailer of her cousin's construction company. If there was anything illegal there, the trail could start there. When she got into the car, she shivered slightly. It was the first time I've had sex in forever, and you weren't particularly gentle. Don't think you'll get anything today. I raised an eyebrow. Tenderness was definitely not on your mind. She smiled slightly, despite her attempts to restrain herself. I noticed that this was the first time I had met her, that she was wearing makeup, albeit casually. I decided to change the plan and took her to the mall. We tried to find a topic to talk about, but we didn't have much in common so the conversation was cut short until we parked in a shopping center parking lot. She looked puzzled. They are here? No, but you're here, and I think we can wait a little while before we really get into the Philip Marlowe case. We want it to be painful for them, 
so there are a few little things we can do. Philip, who? I rolled my eyes. It's truly amazing how little Nikki and I have in common. She caught my sarcastic glance. I don't like you at all. At all. You too. Bastard. Bitch. I took her to the cosmetics counter at Macy's. She looked at me menacingly. Think of it as going undercover. Over the next hour, the two women surrounded her and tried a million makeup combinations, eventually creating a pretty decent look for Nikki, which they taught her how to use their products. She didn't exactly become beautiful, but she achieved a kind of steaming, hungry sexuality. This will do. The set cost me $100 out of my grocery budget, but I'll just skip lunch at work for the next month and I'll be fine. We got back into the car, and she was clutching a small cosmetic bag like the Holy Grail. She didn't want to admit it, but she liked it. So, what was it about? If we want this to hit them harder, you need to have something that Justin lost, something that he feels like he lost, and I need something that makes Beth jealous and envious. That's, it will be you. You hide your makeup when you come home and only wear it when we go out together. She looked puzzled, so I explained my whole plan to her. She was silent for a full minute. Damn, it's a little complicated, and it'll take a long time. I shrugged. Do you have something better in mind, or a better plan? She smiled slightly. No. She asked me to stop by my house to take off my makeup so Justin wouldn't see it. She walked into the bathroom, then came out a couple of minutes later, carrying a towel and nothing but an evil smile and makeup that she had to wash off. The evil glint in her eyes told me everything I needed to know about her intentions. I examined her. I thought you said not to expect anything. She smiled brightly. It would be a shame to waste this makeup. She threw off the towel without any ceremony. We finally finished and headed to her sister's house. Nikki implicated her sister as an accomplice. She never seemed to like Justin much and we're going to need her help. A lot of help. Over the next few months, we stayed home for the most part. I worked out at work at lunchtime, she worked out at home, and we worked out together in the basement until Nikki lost her pregnancy weight and toned everything else down. I bulked up a lot, too. We hid it from our narcissistic spouses by wearing baggy clothes and just being evasive. Still, they didn't pay much attention to us. We also had sex at least five to six times a week, more than I ever had with Beth. We were both stay-at-home with family types, so we decided to change this. The basement of my house became a dance studio. Nikki and I didn't know anything about it at first. But the magic of YouTube triumphed. We had many weekends and evenings as our spouses continued to ignore us. We learned basic dance steps, then more advanced ones. We really liked the salsa, but had to save it for the end of our program, mainly because everyone, damn. Once, we ended up having sex on the floor. One thing I quickly realized was that I was playing with fire. Nikki was not very stable and had the temperament of a half-wild Doberman pincher. Her moods changed without warning, and almost anything could trigger an outburst of unreasonable anger. This whole situation with Beth and Justin has broken something important. One of those fences of sanity has been damaged. I always tried to keep my eyes on her. All the time. The only time she seemed stable was immediately after she was carried to the point of fainting, or when she was around children, mine or hers. Her love for children was overwhelming. We had sex like furious minks constantly. The element of contempt in our relationship meant that nothing was too rough or too dirty for us and we both took advantage of it. She still called me bastard, and I called her bitch, but the terms were, if not exactly loving and affectionate, then strangely tender. But it was all to make us feel better. The real work also had to be done, and we had to do it very, very carefully. Surveilling the construction company's trailer took a month and a half and we only actually managed to get inside because Justin left the keys unattended, and we made a copy. Nikki found an excuse to visit the trailer during the day and was able to film the whole thing on her cell phone. It turned out that the body, 
It turned out that the cousin was too cheap to buy an alarm system. We snuck in here five times in the evening, photographed every document in every file drawer, and began going through the documents bit by bit. Even more useful information was found in Justin's desk and Beth's purse. After a while, neither of us were arguing with our spouses, which was a problem for Beth. She seemed to actually overlook the arguments and seemed to try to start arguments for no reason, but I never took the bait. Well, almost never. Honestly, after having fucking sex with Nikki all day, I didn't have the strength to argue. It took me a while to realize that Beth was probably using these arguments to justify her terrible behavior. Every day she became more and more confused. Justin, on the other hand, seemed to think Nikki had given up and given up. I also made a nice profit on the financial front. I got my $2,000 deposit back for a vacation bungalow at a Mexican beach resort that I was slowly building so I could take Beth there for our anniversary, an event that obviously didn't happen. That will not happen. I didn't expect them to refund the money, but they did. Customer relations, I think. This money will come in handy. When Beth started making excuses to stay the night with Justin, Nikki and I started going to the dance club every now and then, gradually testing out the dance moves we'd learned. It was fun, but not without stress. Nikki's unpredictability constantly stressed me out. She was irritable at the best of times, and could go from joyful excitement to almost psychotic anger without warning if provoked. One particular night almost turned into a disaster and reminded me how careful I need to be. By this time, after weeks of training and almost daily sex, Nikki was practically oozing sex. So it was no surprise that people often cut us off while dancing. She loved the attention, but, unsurprisingly, was sympathetic to jilted girlfriends and tried to maintain her sexuality with guys who had girlfriends. Unfortunately, some guys thought she would dance with them the same way she danced with me, which was not sex on the dance floor. A couple approached us in a small club located a little out of the way. I was dancing with a girl, a cute little blonde cheerleader type, while a guy was apparently trying to put his hands up Nikki's miniskirt. She warned him twice, but he insisted. I just grabbed her by the hair as she rushed towards him. I said, stop. Her sharp claws almost missed his eye, leaving bloody marks on his face. With the little blonde on her side and a hissing, angry Nikki holding her hair, I immediately expected disaster. The guy quickly backed away, eyes wide, while Nikki slowly turned towards me, wrapping her long leg around my hips and pressing her groin tightly against me. Bastard, you pulled my hair. It hurts. She paused, then purred. You really know what I like, don't you? She looked at the blonde who was standing next to me and then winked at her. You can do better than that cream puff guy. You deserve better, he's an asshole. We quickly headed towards the exit. Seemed wise given the three guys in security t-shirts heading towards us. The parking lot was full of cars but empty of people. Two rows away from us I saw a scratched guy and two other guys getting out. He walked towards Nikki while his friends walked towards me. Bitch, Nikki smiled. I didn't know you knew my name. For this shit, your boyfriend can watch me get what's in your panties. Nikki suddenly stopped, as if scared, and he reached out to her, preparing to grab both of her hands. But I could see the crazy glint in her eyes as I felt the largest of the three come up behind me. Nikki lunged not with the hands he grabbed, but with her teeth digging deep into the side of his face. He let out a high, piercing cry of horror and pain. I turned around sharply. I wasn't an MMA champion, but I'd been in more than my fair share of fights. And when I saw the wild look in Nikki's eyes, I was ready. The big guy was expecting a fight or a punch, but he was distracted by his friend's scream and was completely unprepared when I threw a heavy elbow into his face. Expecting a wild blow, he leaned straight into the elbow, which crunched him on the nose. He fell. The second guy stepped forward to pull Nikki away from her screaming victim. So I hit him on the back of his leg, right in the knee, forcing him to his knees. I grabbed his head and kicked it back like a soccer ball, letting it hit the asphalt with a loud sound. Nikki's boyfriend stumbled backwards over the curb. Big mistake. Nikki spat out a piece of flesh. At least that's what I hoped 
and slammed her stiletto into his groin. His scream rose beyond human hearing. I pulled her back as she prepared to punch him in the chest. Nikki, stop! She looked at me with a defiantly mad look, then stopped and smiled. She turned around and put her hands on the nearest car, standing almost above her suffocating victim. Take me, here, now, and I'll let him go. I would never have thought that something like this could turn me on, but I did it. As I stepped away from her and zipped up, I saw a couple of figures standing 15 feet away in the parking lot. A small blonde girl and a gothic girl with dark hair, standing in shock. Nikki pulled down her panties and stepped out of them, then picked them up, wiped herself with them, and threw them in the face of her moaning victim. Here, you can take it. This is what's in my panties. She then saw the startled blonde and walked towards her. I wanted to grab her and run, but I knew it would cause rage. And if I didn't get her out of here quickly, we'd both be in jail by morning. She walked over to the stunned blonde and stood over her. Nikki, be nice. She didn't do anything wrong. Nikki looked at me and smiled. Oh, I know it's not her fault. She pulled the blonde towards her and kissed her passionately. I was about to intervene when I realized that the blonde was kissing him back with fervor. Nikki slowly let her go. The blonde looked at her as if spellbound, and her face was stained with the blood of her own boyfriend. Believe me, Cream Plush, you can find someone better than him. I saw the goth girl pick up Cream Plush when her legs gave way. Once we were in the car, Nikki took off her top and wiped her face. The ambulance passed by about two miles away. I didn't have to guess where she was going, and I could only hope that no one remembered our numbers. I pulled into a rest stop to give Nikki my shirt, but getting dressed wasn't her immediate interest, so I reclined the seat and let her unzip my fly and have sex with me until she was satisfied. It took a long time. She was silent for a few minutes, then commented, I'm really confused, aren't I? We're all confused about something, but I really enjoyed it. It felt so good to hurt him. Yeah, I noticed. It's a bit disturbing in a Hannibal Lecter way. Hurting him was like having sex. I could let all the anger out. He deserved it. Well, I'm not sure the law would agree, but I think his girlfriend liked it. Nikki laughed. She stuck her tongue out at me first. Damn, I've got some competition. She thought about it. Seriously, is this all about hurting? Don't let me do this again, promise me. Very seriously. Tears sparkled in her eyes. You were defending yourself? I know, but I didn't really do it. I wanted to hurt him. So, so bad. If it happens again, what if I can't stop? What if I can't find my way back? Suddenly she sounded like a lost little child afraid of the dark. It honestly scared the crap out of me. Nikki probably needed real help, medication. Hell, she probably needed to be committed to a mental hospital. We made it to the papers. A brutal attack in a parking lot was attributed to a gang of six men and a Latina woman, according to a witness. Cream Plush, who apparently was actually named Amber. I had to laugh at this when I showed Nikki's story. So, you seem to have impressed Amber? Nikki smiled. I thought she was cute. Strawberry-flavored lipstick. Do you like girls? I didn't think she was. I was just teasing her in the club, but... In the parking lot, it was a different story. She wanted me, I felt it, and that made me want her. I looked her straight in the eyes while you had me, and she wanted me to have sex with her. I saw it in her eyes. And since you and I have been together, I simply have no boundaries in sex. After this incident, Nikki seemed to struggle for more self-control. Got better. Slow, uneven, but gradually getting better. I saw her fight to hold back the demon when it appeared. Sometimes she even managed to win. We continued to go to clubs, but we were much more relaxed. Nikki's sister couldn't watch the kids every night, and I wasn't about to give up all my time with my little angels, so Nikki would often bring Jamie over and we'd exercise after putting them to bed, checking on them every now and then until it was time for Nikki to leave. As we stood in the doorway checking them out, I would sometimes steal a glance at Nikki and marvel at the softness in her expression that never seemed to be there at other times. 
and sometimes she caught me looking and gave me a sad, gentle half-smile. At such moments, her demons seemed very far away. Sooner or later, I knew something would happen. Beth eventually caught me shirtless and noticed my weight loss and new muscles, and commented on it. I chalked it up to stress, which she tried to turn into an argument, but I had already put on my shirt and left the room. Mostly I wanted to avoid her seeing Nikki's nail marks on my back and ass from the night before. I felt that she didn't believe me. Beth's deepening suspicion meant we had to move on to the next phase. So I told Nikki it was time for more Philip Marlov stuff. She rolled her eyes at me over her shoulder. At that moment, I was up to my tomatoes in her. So a few days later, instead of training and sex, we had a car and a nice digital camera, which we occupied, ready to go, and when Beth and Justin left, we quietly followed them at a distance. This was not real stalking. Nikki intercepted receipts and credit cards until we figured out their routine. Beth was careful and prudent, but in Justin's head, Nikki was crushed, unable to defend herself, so he was careless and stupid. Justin's parents owned a small hut near the shore, lost in the woods. It was a little shabby, but the mileage on the car showed that this was where they went on Fridays when they skipped the gym entirely. We turned off the road and quietly approached the hut with the camera. There were no curtains, so it was not difficult to find them and observe them. They were already naked on the bed when we got into position. Beth was pleasuring Justin. I carefully and quietly took photos while Nikki and I watched. I felt Nikki fumbling with my jeans, pulling them off. Despite my muted attempts to stop her, she got down to business. Perhaps I didn't resist her too much. I tried to get her to take the situation seriously. Since we had to walk back to the car, I let some air out of one of Justin's tires to slow them down if they tried to leave early. We took the film to a dark room that specialized in discreet one-day printing and then headed home. Beth arrived much later than usual, her clothes and hair a mess. The next day, a cheerful Nikki told me that Justin had replaced a flat tire and then hit a nail on the way home, leading to a harrowing trip in the rain to get a tire refill at a store four miles away. As they said in the army, revenge is a bitch and its slutty name is karma. Over the next week, we talked a lot, really talked about what we really wanted to happen. Nikki surprised me to the core, but I ultimately agreed. We stayed quiet, then made our big move about three weeks after we had organized our evidence. Beth and Justin always disappeared for the entire day on Saturdays, but Nikki and I figured out their routine. First to the gym, then to the hut for sex and shower, then to the nightclub to dance and have fun, they usually returned home around 6 or 7 a.m. on Sunday, but this time things were going to be a little different. As soon as they left, we took the kids to Nikki's sister and hit the road. First, we went shopping. Nikki chose a tight dress in a rich emerald color with a deep neckline and a very short hem. The emerald green color really brought out her hair. I had a dark gray suit with a black t-shirt. I took her to a full-blown beauty salon and told them to do what you want, hair and makeup. Dressed, we headed to the club. We walked in there as if it belonged to us. Theoretically, the bartender should have checked on us, but Nikki looked like pure sex on a stick. A million squats gave her an ass that could stop movement in jeans, and she didn't wear jeans. She was wearing a paper-thin dress that hid almost nothing and it was obvious that there was not a thread underneath. Since one of the bartender's jobs is to make sure the crowd is interesting, we were let in without showing any ID. First, we went to the dance floor. Then they continued to the main event. I asked a friend to check where Justin and Beth usually sat at the club, and it turned out that they always occupied the same married meeting corner every Saturday. When we had danced a few songs, we headed to their table. Nikki walked proudly forward, holding my hand. Beth was wearing a yellow dress that I had never seen. Justin was wearing a blue suit. I'd be lying if I said Nikki looked better than Beth. Beth was tanned and elegant. However, Nikki was gorgeous, and rather than looking elegant or sophisticated, she proudly carried a bad girl aura of pure sex and immorality drawing glances from all over the room. 
I pulled out a chair at their table for Nikki, then sat down myself. Beth and Justin appeared to be frozen in absolute shock. I looked around with artificial surprise. Very nice. Most gyms are less fancy. Justin's face darkened and he glared at Nikki. That dress. You spent money on... I interjected with sternness in my voice. No, I did it. I threw a stack of photos of the house on the table. These were the most disgusting pictures I could find. Most of the photographs I took were much more compassionate because they were of beautiful people. I went through the stack and chose the worst ones. In them, people looked sad, clumsy, and dirty. I continued, I got part of my deposit back on a bungalow on the Mexican coast that I wanted to surprise Beth with for our anniversary. Since that's not going to happen, I thought I'd buy something useful. Something flashed across Beth's face. Disappointment? Maybe. She was most likely upset to learn that there was more money than she thought. Looking down at the laid-out photographs, Justin finally sensed danger, and he fell silent. Beth turned pale against her tan. So, how long? We've been working together for almost four months. How did you know everything? I didn't really have to figure out anything. You didn't try to hide it. You just assumed we'd be too overwhelmed or too weak to do anything. Justin tried to regain the initiative and snorted derisively. So what? You two have fallen in love? Nikki smirked. I don't like him at all. He's a complete bastard. And she's a complete bitch. I don't like her at all. Nikki's smile widened and took on a predatory tone. But sex? Oh God, it's incredible. Nothing like violent revenge. All the dirtiest things you can imagine. She looked straight at Beth. And a lot more than you'd ever think of. I certainly didn't. But a little rejection will go a long way in convincing a girl to try things. She said the last part, turning her gaze to Justin. Beth recoiled as if she had been hit and looked at me. You can't do that. We were trying to make things work. Well, that's nonsense. I laughed, but without any joy. Hardly. You were just beating time until the asshole was ready here, and you had sex with him three or four times a week while I was sitting with the girls and living like a damn monk. People have been coming to the office to give me bad news for months. Not only did you cheat, but you made it a public spectacle. We didn't have to do surveillance to find you. It was like following an EF-5 tornado, just following the destruction. I felt my anger quickly building, but Nikki squeezed my leg. Nikki was calmer this time. She took the initiative into her own hands. Obviously, there will be divorces due to infidelity. It won't affect the money, but let's face it, it's fairer, and we'll be better off for it. My new hobby will be to make sure the whole world gets copies of the photos and a full explanation of how you destroyed their marriages. Family, colleagues, employers. Damn, I'll find your first grade Sunday school teacher. She focused on Justin for a second. By the way, asshole, I'm moving in with my sister now, with Jamie. Having regained my composure, I added the clincher. A little more serious for you is the fact that you two were stealing money from a materials account at a construction company. It took us a long time to figure it out. But when Nikki realized you were spending like sailors on vacation, we knew it had to be from somewhere. Nikki and I have gathered more than enough evidence. There are tax issues, internet fraud, even one mail fraud charge. So even if Justin's cousin puts up with this, you have serious problems. Perhaps enough for five to ten years in prison for you, pointing at Justin. And a couple of years in prison as an accessory for you, pointing at Beth. Beth, her eyes widening, immediately tried to defend herself. I didn't know. I thought it was his money. I was putting it in the account so that it wouldn't go to him during the divorce. I interrupted her. Yeah, you were keeping it for a free in. How often does that work in court? Besides, it puts that money right in our divorce. If my name was on that account, I'd think, you're setting me up. It would end badly. Beth and Justin turned pale. I suspected they had toyed with the idea, but seemed to have decided against it. I suggested an alternative that Nikki and I worked through. You have one chance at a slightly better future. Justin runs away, quit his job, and went to the mountains. 
at least 400 miles away, takes his car, clothes, football trophies, and yearbook. Nothing else. Not a damn thing. Nikki serves for divorce due to abandonment. She still won't get anything because of the secret arrangement with his cousin. We are not giving evidence to the police or his cousin. If his cousin finds out on his own and takes action, it's a shame. I would recommend that you return all the money that you still have a bill for materials. This may influence whether he starts looking for you. I looked at Beth. I'm filing for divorce with the idea that I'll get primary custody, no alimony, and no maintenance, with cheating as the reason. You agree to this or you go to jail and I just take full custody, which applies to all of our things. Make a list of everything you want, but it has to be short. You can keep your clothes, and you can keep all those damn shoes. Nikki chimed in. He offered me your stuff, but the shoes are too small and the clothes suck. I've stopped wearing underwear around him, so you can keep your granny panties. I sent Nikki a playful look as Beth was barely holding her breath. I continued, get a job, move in with your parents, or with anyone. I don't care anymore. You can see the kids as much as you want. I won't interfere. You were a good mom. I won't even tell your parents what happened. I looked at them closely to make sure they were paying attention. This offer is a one-time offer. Expires tomorrow at midnight. If Justin's ass isn't on the road by then, we'll turn it over to his cousin and the police. Offer still stands, only if both agree. Nikki leaned forward, showing off her impressive cleavage probably for Beth's sake. You guys have achieved one amazing achievement, the two of us. We meant it when we said we had nothing in common. We couldn't agree on a movie to save a life, hated each other's music, and if he talked about any of his hobbies, I would fall into a coma. And she's a shallow, emotional witch whose voice grates on my nerves like broken glass, I added. Nikki continued, her gaze locked with Justin like a snake with its prey. So when we were dating... When we weren't making plans to punish you, we were doing only one thing. We were doing with each other until they lose consciousness in the most perverted ways. If we had dinner together, it was only to gain strength for the next time. She looked at Beth. I can't believe you left him for this low life. I'm not bluffing. If you think so, join us next time and you can watch. It'll probably make it even hotter. If it is, it's not at all possible but watching you get your ass kicked by your husband would be completely insane, so call me any time if you want to watch. I looked at my watch and interjected. Remember the deal. Sorry, we have to go. I need to pick up the kids. I stood up and extended my hand to Nikki to help her up. She stood up and then leaned towards them. Go ahead and have sex again. We'll stop on the way back and I'll have sex in every possible way. Hateful woman. But she wasn't lying or exaggerating. We stayed at the hotel and she was absolutely stunning. Looks like the way she told off Justin and Beth turned her on to the limit were engaged in wild love. Within an hour, we had already gone home. We had outdone ourselves. But something had changed in Nikki. Perhaps it was the clash with Justin and Beth, but the insane rage seemed to have disappeared. She just disappeared. She was still just as sexually active, but that sparkling edge of real madness was missing. Beth almost beat me home. I'd just put the kids to bed when she burst through the front door. And she froze a. I didn't show her on purpose, and it smelled like Nikki. Beth has always had a sensitive nose. The air freshener was an important element in keeping our secret. We need to talk. I sank into a chair. We should have talked months ago. Look, can we back up a little? You can't just let this bitch ruin our- Stop! I raised my hand. The only bitch who ruined this marriage is standing in front of me. She stared at me, which was especially unattractive to her. I continued, You really don't understand, Beth. You got it sweeter than Justin, and here's why. Nikki bargained for you. She begged and begged on your behalf. She tried to make Justin the real villain in this story, and you have no idea how difficult it was for her. She hated you with every fiber of her being, but she did it anyway. She felt that her disaster caused ours. I'm not even sure I agree with it, but I accepted the deal. Because she begged me. I stopped, controlling my anger before it exploded. Then in Mishra tones, if the money laundering account had been in my name, or if the DNA test on the twins had come back different, 
we wouldn't be talking. They're pouring the foundation for a factory on 5th Street, and I have a copy of the key to the construction site. You and the bastard would just disappear. Nikki could beg all she wanted, and it wouldn't matter. She blinked, suddenly realizing how alone we were. How long do I have to move out? I should have given you until midnight tomorrow just for the damn neat symmetry of it all, but I'll give you a week. It'll take you two days just to pack all those shoes, and God knows I want them gone. She muttered something like an apology and then walked up the stairs. She left after five days, and I was left alone with the children. Even with the twins, the house seemed empty. I heard Justin's cousin was looking for him but didn't call the police. I hope he hid himself well. The cousin has always had a violent streak. I cheated a little on my promise not to let his cousin know. Two weeks after that, I gave the twins to Beth and her parents for the weekend. They were aware of the rules, and Beth was well aware that any nonsense would lead to a fast track to prison. Almost at midnight, someone knocked on the door. When I opened it, Nikki was standing there in full war paint and club clothes, looking almost deliriously joyful. At least someone has adapted. So she left. I nodded. Back to my parents, trying to explain the mysterious copy of the divorce suit from The House Wrecker Bitch Written on It in Red Lipstick. Thanks for sending this. Nikki's smile grew wider and more malicious. Great. I wanted to do something nice for her. Give them something to talk about. I laughed. I promised not to tell Beth's parents, but Nikki didn't promise. In fact, she promised the opposite. So a whole series of packages were sent to Beth's friends and family. With photos. I doubt she'll ever get over it. Nikki's smile became even more malicious. Hey! I brought a housewarming gift. I almost corrected her. After all, I didn't move. But in a sense, she was right. The house seemed new. Thought we could share dessert. A familiar blonde face looked out behind her. I bought custard. Poor, poor Amber. She wasn't particularly experienced, and the two of us shared her like the delicacy she was. We pulled her into our storm. She was less a partner and more a catalyst for an open flame. Not that she's complaining, after everything Nikki and I have done to each other over the past months, we were able to give Amber a crash course pleasure. She lost consciousness twice. The next morning, Nikki smiled like the cat that ate the canary as she helped Amber, who could barely walk on her still wobbly legs, walk to her car. A few nights later, Nikki came alone. A few nights later, she came with Jamie. After the kids fell asleep, she wordlessly pulled me straight into the bedroom. This time we moved slower, much slower. Afterwards, I lay looking at the ceiling and her head rested on my shoulder while her finger traced a pattern on my chest. We can't go on with this, Nikki. I felt her tense up. I continued. We had some kind of agreement. I know we never said it out right, but I think we agreed that we had nothing in common. No feelings. And I have a problem with that. Silence. Then quietly, bastard, you must have been a slow learner as a child. They had to bring in a specialist to teach you to walk? Bitch. Post-production notes. Here it is. My version of the BTB story with some graphic sex scenes. I just had to write it to see what would happen. What a journey. Changed the ending a dozen times. Rack. Shallow graves under the foundation on Fifth Street. Perhaps a prison for traitors. In the end, I let Nikki choose. Still, she suffered the most. She lost her husband, her self-respect, and, at least to some extent, her sanity. So I just asked her. Beth may not have suffered as much as some would have liked, but it was Nikki's choice. And Nikki is complex and possibly crazy, so it's really hard to understand her choices here. Perhaps she believes there is little chance of redemption, at least for some. Or perhaps she wants Beth to see what she lost because of her. And make no mistake, Beth lost everything she truly valued. Nikki did her best to make sure this was the case. And Nikki probably wouldn't have been as satisfied with it if Beth had ended up in jail. Nikki wouldn't have been able to enjoy the show. Nikki will even have real control over Beth's access to her own daughters, given some time to come. This whole thing, from that first day standing in the rain, could have been her plan all along. I'm honestly not sure and don't want to ask. She could answer. Nikki has a permanent place in my heart. 
perhaps more than any other female character I've ever written. She may not be as pretty as Beth, but so what? She loves passionately and unconditionally, and will not let go now until she turns to dust. I'm sure she'll win Amber back many times over, but Amber isn't a threat to their relationship. She is what Nikki wants to share with the man she loves. As Nikki said, Amber is kind of like a treat. That extra piece of cheesecake that you couldn't eat yourself, but are happy to share. Nikki is just expressing her love in a slightly unconventional way. Sure, she's manipulative and crazy, maybe even dangerous, but aren't all good ones like that. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.